Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Scott Lamb and Mr. David Brody. Good evening. For those of you that I have not met, my name is Joanne Drake, and I serve as the Chief Administrative Officer of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. In honor of our men and women in uniform around the world, it is our tradition here to ask you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. It should not be overlooked this evening that we lost an extraordinary human being, a great American, and a true champion for God this morning. If you would, please join me in a moment of silence to honor the Reverend Billy Graham. Thank you. Before we meet our two distinguished authors, I want to thank a couple of special guests we have with us this evening. Author of The Shroud Conspiracy and its sequel, The Second Coming, which is being released in August, the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute is with us, with us this evening, Mr. John Highbush. Also here is one of the former military officers who carried the famous football for President Reagan and a good friend of the foundations, Steve Chilander. Now we have a special treat tonight for our presentation, not just one author, but two. And as I started researching both of them to find out why they started on this journey to learn about the faith of our 45th president, it struck me that these are two gentlemen of quite dissimilar backgrounds. Yet they managed to create a congruent partnership, produced an important look into the background, base, and present day spiritual life of President Trump, and the relationship survived, so they can tell us about it tonight. <laughs> Our first author, Scott Lamb, grew up in a Southern Baptist home in Missouri, and according to him, was in church every time the door was open. He went on to become a full-fledged Baptist minister with a little writing on the side. He currently writes the Jesus in the Public Square column for the Washington Times, and he's also authored biographies on the faith-filled life of a few others that many of you might recognize, former Governor Mike Huckabee and Albert Pujols, of all people, one of baseball's greatest and most consistent hitters, now first baseman for the Los Angeles Angels. And when he's not at home with his wife and five children, Scott Lamb now serves as the Vice President of Special Literary Projects at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. His co-author, David Brody, grew up in a Jewish family, attended Temple, Hebrew school, and I believe was bar mitzvahed at 13. His life as a Christian really didn't start until college through the influence of, you guessed it, a girl. <laughs> that girl became his wife, and now they have three children. And that young Jewish boy from Manhattan now calls himself an evangelical. And he's become an Emmy award-winning political reporter, currently serving as the White House correspondent for the Christian Broadcasting Network. In 2016, you would have found him on the trail of presidential candidates across this country, and not just Donald Trump's. Something that he does have in common with Scott is that they share a love of writing. David Brody is not just a bi biographer of presidents. Many of you probably read his blog called The Brody File on the CBN News site. Now, when I spoke with Scott Lamb last week about this book and this evening's presentation, 
He told me that many thought the title of the book was a marketing ploy. Because admit it, most people probably looked at the book with the picture of President Trump on the cover, which you'll see here, and the words, The Faith of Donald J. Trump, a spiritual biography, and thought, yeah, sure, tell me another good one. <laughs> many, many probably did think it was a joke. And the rumor is that Saturday Night Live and other pundits have been sending Scott and David thank you notes for giving them such easy fodder for their shows. Once you read the book, though, I think you're going to see it a little differently. Some may have called it laughable. Some thought it was a gag. Others have called it bold, extraordinary, straightforward, and unapologetic. Many are just wondering how you can attribute the words faith and spiritual to Donald Trump. But what Scott told me last week was, this book isn't about President Trump's external actions of spirituality. It's an effort to explain the worldview of the man, including his philosophy for understanding the world, himself, life, and eternity, and how his structure of beliefs played out in the 2016 campaign and the first couple months of his administration. And you can't do this without learning the fascinating story of the president's parents, his grandparents, and his siblings. And yes, the evangelicals will play an important role in all of this. As Scott and David say in the early pages of their book, it is not a definitive biography of Donald J. Trump. It is a spiritual biography. And after reading it, I would say that it is just the first on this topic that will be done in the future. I'm going to admit that I was skeptical when I picked the book up. I'm betting I wasn't alone in that. But in trying to figure out what makes Donald Trump tick in terms of faith, I was struck by the chapters on prosper reality and a quote by Paula White, who is currently the pastor of New Destiny Christian Church in Apopka, Florida. She's also a very popular television preacher. Over the last 15 or so years, it turns out she's become both a friend and a spiritual advisor to the president. She said, way before his run for the presidency, way before involvement in the party, way before becoming a politician, he was a man seeking God, a man who was spiritually hungry, watching Christian television and listening to Southern gospel music. We are this work in progress that is continually growing, as long as our heart is open to God and as long as we are seeking God. Ladies and gentlemen, Together, Scott Lamb and David Brody have done what we have all been told never to do. They've brought politics and religion together and published it. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Scott Lamb and David Brody. Yes, indeed. So a Southern Baptist boy from the Midwest and a Jewish, uh, now evangelical, get together to write a book about a president. There's a lot of backstory to all that, but um, as you know, and we've already uh, had a moment of silence, what a day to be at the Reagan Library. Um, you know, when you think about the 20th uh, century and the history and America's leadership in the world and the events of the world and the fall of communism, you know, this is um, hallowed ground, you know, for understanding how it is that communism, which at its root uh, was, um, had uh, soul implications, right? I mean, it wasn't just material things. It was uh, saying something about what it is on the inside of people and how we can uh, conquer over them. And, and uh, Reagan was opposed to that. And Reagan, along with John Paul, Pope John Paul II, uh, obviously went right to the heart, not just of the politics, but also of the spirit. Um, first time I was ever in Reagan Library, uh, I was sitting on one of these chairs here at the end of a trip uh, that uh, a gentleman here on the front row named David Lane had sponsored for us to go on. And uh, along with Mike Huckabee, we went to Poland and saw some of those places that Pope John Paul had, had been where he spoke to the soul of the Polish people, essentially telling them, you know, remember that you have a soul, you know, and, and that's how you conquer over. It might, it might take a long time, but that's how you conquer over things like communism. And then we came all the way out here after going through London and seeing some things about Churchill and Thatcher. We came all the way here and, uh, and, and saw this place. It was my first time being here. 
And I'll never forget those kinds of things because you, you understand that great men and women of history who, who help lead nations to going in the right direction, they don't forget that we're not just material, uh, flesh and bones, we're souls, we have a spirit. And so my co-author and I, we uh, began talking uh, two or three years ago as we met through uh, these kinds of encounters and uh, started talking about the re intersection of faith and politics and eventually after the election, so on November 9th, um, actually, I think it was on November 8th, uh, we had a conversation. So what's going to come of all this? And, uh, mm -hmm. and David, uh, what, what came of all this? Well, this right here, uh, <laughs> the faith of Donald Trump. Uh, you know, it kind of made me think of the Southern Baptist and a, you know, Southern Baptist and a Jew walk into a library. It sounds like a joke. Um, it does. But uh, I'm just saying. Uh, so where do we begin? Um, so let's just get right to the title, shall we? Because the, the faith of Donald Trump. And I, look, I, w I was doing a media tour in New York this past week uh, or last week. I don't know what week it is. Uh, and I was on with CNN's New Day, Chris Cuomo, one-on-one. -on -one. That was fun. Um, <laughs> Joe Scarborough. Uh, so I don't know who was taking more Excedrin, me or them. Uh, but the bottom line is th they had an issue with the title, this just in. And look, here's the thing. I told him it's not, the, the title is not the sainthood of Donald Trump. And I think that's really important. This is not an apologetics book uh, for Donald Trump at all. I, that's why you have to read it. And a lot of folks that think that uh, it, it is anything like that probably just haven't read it. Um, so, so I think that's an important point to make. Also, I would say this. One of the things we did in the book is we made sure, we talked to what, it was about 100 folks or so. Yeah. Uh, we talked to the, uh, the President of the United States for the actual book. Uh, sorry, Michael Wolf, if you're here tonight. Um, <laughs> but we actually had a, a, an interview, I'm sorry. Uh, we had an interview in the Oval Office with the President. We also had two with the Vice President, uh, Paula White, Kellyanne Conway, many other folks in the book. And, and what, what, they'll, what they all say, all of the evangelical leaders that we talk to that know this president well, that know a different side of him, believe me, it's not the Twitter side we're referring to here, but it's a different side that you haven't heard much about. Uh, they will say that he is a believer. Now, you might say, well, of course they're going to say that. You know, they just want access. Well, we challenge them on that, and you can read in the book about it. But, uh, you know, whether it be Paula White. Now, Paula White, um, she actually said she had an in-depth, many actually, in-depth spiritual conversations. That's what she calls a spiritual conversation with Donald Trump about the Jesus plus nothing. In other words, do you understand this is not about good works? This is not about, he says, yes, he understands. She says 100% he's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's not us saying that. That's her saying that. Uh, and then you, you can go down the list of evangelical leaders. And then there's a guy by the name of Mike Pence who has some relative street cred in evangelical Christianity oh. uh, who also says he is a believer 100% as well. Now, that's Mike Pence. So if you don't believe that, then how much else are you really going to believe with Mike Pence? In other words, if you, if, if you don't believe him on that, then you have to question, well, what else is he selling you? Uh, and so that's just something to consider. So, and and that, yeah. get, that gets the heart of it. You know, when you release a book, uh, whether it's one about uh, President Trump or, or really any book, you, you learn that there's a lot of people out there with really strong opinions about what you've just written, or in some cases, uh, uh, about the person you've written about. And uh, so when I wrote the book about the baseball player, you know, people get on Amazon, they say, I don't like him as a baseball player. I don't, I, he's overrated. And they give you a one star on Amazon. Well, well thanks, I, I appreciate that. You know, I didn't read the book, but I can't stand him. He makes too much money, one star, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so you get all these sets of opinions and, and it's only gotten more in, uh, intense uh, with the rise of social media, tw Twitter and Facebook. And so Dave and I joke, we were like, yeah, let's just remind our wives to stay off of Twitter for the next couple of weeks, yeah. you know, because between the memes and all this stuff, there's just a lot of crazy stuff that gets said about, about you on a personal level, you know, so we're, we're sellouts, we're, we're, we're headed for hell and all that kind of stuff because we, we wrote a book that kind of explains the history of this one particular man and his family. Now, we made it really clear in the book right from the front, we're not actually saying that we've looked into the man's soul as God does, and we're not making a declaration. We, we interviewed people, and they made some declarations, as David said, and, and so th we let their declarations uh, stand. They're the ones who were friends, and some kind, in some cases, spiritual mentors, and they don't mind going on the record. So we had some uh, discussion with people, and we said, well, uh, are, you, are you saying such and such? We're not saying such and such. We're saying that so-and-so said it, and we'd say, well, like Paula White, 
And I remember we had a conversation when, and it went like this. Well, Paula White said, you know, that uh, she believes that he, uh, you know, has become a Christian and things like that. And the response was, Paula White, you know, uh, she's, like a, she's like a charlatan. She's a heretic. She's a, a Pentecostal or, or she's a woman preacher. You know, you fill in the blank. Of, and like, okay, all right, so... <clears throat> Okay, so, all right, I, the evidence, line of evidence, you're not going to go with Paula White. All right, so James Robeson, and you know, some, maybe you've known him. He's been around for 50 years, a gospel preacher. He, he helped, uh, you know, he talked to President Reagan and Carter. I mean, he's been around forever preaching the gospel. He was a Southern Baptist. He's not a woman preacher, right? You know, so James, oh, no, no, but doesn't he have that show on that, uh, on that one network? And they're not really on the up and up. And like, really? So all of a sudden, you know, well, what, what kind of line of evidence did, would you like, you know? And so then, you know, you pull out the ultimate. So, well, now David talked to the vice president. Well, now see, that's the thing. <laughs> you see, he was okay until 2016, you know? He was all right. And I, I really thought he was a Christian, but how could a Christian, how could a Christian support this president? So I don't even know if he's a Christian now. I'm like, wow. All right, so basically there's nobody on the planet, maybe except Billy Graham, I don't know. Nobody that is going to be able to, like, you know, you're going to be able to say what they said about this man. And at that point, you just got to say, well, maybe we're not going to try to respond to all that critics. Maybe we're just going to actually try to write a good book, do journalistic work, uh, dig down into the storyline of his, the fascinating Trump family, which has not been told all that much at all, uh, the father and the grandfather, and just let, let the facts speak for themselves. And I think that's what you're supposed to do in journalism and book writing, you know. It's not a book of yeah. opinions. That's what, uh, what we're trying to get at. Is. And, I, and I would say this, the facts led us here to the fact that he is on, and aren't we all, a spiritual voyage of some sort. But for Donald Trump, boy, is it been a pothole. Yeah, it's been everywhere. Uh, but he is on a spiritual voyage, and especially in the last couple of years. Now, a lot of folks may scoff at that and say, give me a break. I just looked at his Twitter feed. He's not on any voyage. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that we have behind the scenes reporting everything from, uh, let me just say this, the common theme is curiosity with this president. What do I mean by that? He is curious about the things of God more now at 71 years old than he has ever been. We have details in the book about him approaching Mike Pence asking for prayer, and, and there's details more in the book. But uh, I can go on. There's two or three times at least that that has happened. It's, I'm sure it's a lot more than that. Uh, and you just go down the line, and there's all of these times that he is encouraging folks to please come around him and pray. He wants it. He encourages. You know what? And God can work with curiosity. And that's the good, hopeful news if you are a fan, if you are a fan of Donald Trump. And we're not suggesting this book is, it, once again, this book is not the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, that's a different book. Uh, <laughs> Uh, written by a different author. And, and so real, real, yeah, that's true. Not, not my lamb's book, but. Uh, <laughs> no, so, not your book. No, this is the lamb. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So to break down the book, there's a part one and a part two, and both were necessary, and both are really kind of different. Uh, part one is basically a history of the Trump family, not a definitive history where it tells the whole thing. You know, that would take thousands of pages now at this point, but uh, a, a history of the, the Trump family and their background as it relates to religion, worldview, theology. Now, so, so here's the big thesis. The Trump family, from Donald back to his father and grandparents, they are not secularists, okay? So if, if, if you met somebody who's like, I, I don't have anything to do with religion, I'm not an, even an atheist, because that would mean I'm like thinking about theism. No, I, I just don't have anything to do with it, right? And I never have, and I never will, my parents didn't. If that, that would be kind of hard to write a book about a, you know, somebody, the faith of somebody in a spiritual biography. But get this, the Trumps have not been like that at all. Um, now. Uh, we're not making a claim that, you know, in an evangelical language that they're born again. That's not the point. The point is that they are replete with um, religion, uh, religious practice, uh, worldview, uh, thoughts about who God is and, uh, and, and and what is in the afterlife. And everybody is a theologian. Some people are, are, are more, you know, true to scripture than others, but everybody's a theologian. Everybody has, walks around with an understanding about God and, and the way the world works, right? I mean, everybody in this room has some idea, um, and, and it might actually be a true, you know, as God sees it, or it might not be. But the point is, the Trumps are not secularists. And so there's so much material. We were asked, uh, where are you gonna come up with all this material? Seth, uh, Seth Myers? Seth Myers. Yeah, six months ago when they sent out a press release about the book. Um, our publicist said, uh, you know, I've never had somebody get made fun of on a, on a uh, comedy show 
before they actually wrote the first page of the book, you know. So Seth Meyers, he did this thing and he kind of made fun of uh, David here uh, really good. And he said, yeah, this is the first, it's going to be so short, it's going to be the first book that's written on a chiclet. And, uh, and they, he showed a picture of a chiclet and it said, I have none, you know, I have no faith. And uh, so the, the, we did not run out of material. Uh, the publisher called for 70,000 words. We wound up writing 120,000 words and then we had to figure out how to lop it down because there was just so much material to, with which to work. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the fact of the matter is it's the worldview. It's the, the way that the Trumps thought um, about the world and about God. And, and it may or may not square with um, orthodox theology, evangelical theology, but it's, worth, it's a story worth telling because, after all, it's the sitting president of the United States. Wouldn't you like to know what his dad and mom thought right. about God? And that, that, was our, that was our basic thought. Well, and also he grew up in a mainline Presbyterian background and, you know, and now all of a sudden he's surrounded by full gospel, fire breathing, Pentecostal, the hot coals in the Oval Office. I mean, you know, it's everything. And so this is something that has shocked him uh, and something I asked him about. And he says that uh, being around people like this, I've never been around people like this before and that it has impacted me greatly. And if you wonder why it may have impacted him greatly. Look at some of what we've seen just recently in the last year or so. If you remember the National Prayer Breakfast in the first year when he, when he spoke there, uh, it was about apprentice ratings and I'm going to take care of the Johnson Amendment. It was all about him. Uh, this time around, there were no mentions of the apprentice ratings. There were no mentions at all about what he had accomplished in his first year and there was a lot to talk about. Instead, he talked more about God and less of himself. Uh, that, that's an example of what our research indicates, which is that there is, call it slow, call it molasses, call it whatever you want, but there's, there's something going on uh, inside the White House. And I, I told Chris Cuomo the other day on CNN's New Day, I said, Chris, here's the thing. If you have a, th I'm going to put it in television terms for you, if you have a 30-second soundbite, uh, you're telling 12 seconds of, of the story. You're, you're, you know, Russia and a lot of this, the Twitter feed, and all, all legitimate all true in, in the sense of, you know, stories that need to be reported. There's another 18 seconds. 18 plus 12 equals 30. There's another 18 seconds. That's what this book is. It just takes 18 seconds to read. Uh, so, anyhow, <laughs> it's a scratch and sniff book. Um, so, so, anyhow. Tell, tell them about the second part. We were talking about the first part, but tell them about the second well, part. Well, the second part is on the campaign trail. And so that's when we get into some of the, um, well, do I say juicier stories? Yeah, uh, yeah. Sure, yeah. more colorful stories, for sure. Uh, I remember one time Donald Trump uh, called me up. Oh, well, I'll never forget this. Uh, do you remember when he was asked, like, his favorite Bible verse? I don't know if you ever remember that, right? And he was like, oh, you know, I love it all, you know, the whole thing. You know, I'm like, are you an Old Testament guy, a New Testament guy? He was like, you know, I, lo I love both books. And so, anyhow. So he calls me up uh, the next morning, and he's like, and he says to me, he goes, what do you think? You know, hey, whoa, man, that was pretty good, right? So I said, so I said, so here's the thing, you probably need to give them a little bit more meat. Uh, you know, as in like evangelicals, you know, if you're going to talk about the Bible, it would be probably important to maybe quote from the Bible, you know, something like that. So anyhow, bottom line is at the end of the day, he goes ahead and uh, says to me, well, could you maybe say, now he wasn't saying he wanted to use these. He was just saying, maybe you can send me some of your favorite Bible verses. Well, I did, because you know what, if Hillary Clinton had called and she didn't, by the way. Um, <laughs> this just in, that's on the record. Um, but if Hillary Clinton had called, I would have done the same exact thing. If Bernie Sanders had called, absolutely. You know? Yeah, but, but here's the thing, Dave. Well, yeah. You gave him Bible verses, mm -hmm. and he didn't actually even use well, them. Well, that's what I was going to get to. He never used them, which says everything you need to know about Trump. He could have trotted it out and pandered to evangelicals. Look, he doesn't, even if he wanted to pander to evangelicals, he wouldn't know how to pander yeah. to evangelicals. I remember the first, we do, we do a quick story in the book, first story in the introduction, 2011, my first interview with Donald Trump. I've interviewed him about 16 times since 2011. First interview, he walks in, he's got this Presbyterian picture. Look, I was confirmed, you know, he's going to, and, and then, and then it's so funny because I ask them, the CBN, because I am work for Christian Broadcasting Network, and I say, so tell me a little bit about the church attendance. How's that working for you? And he says, look, I go to church on Easter, and I go on Christmas, and I go on a few Sundays. So I'm thinking that's probably not the best answer for the Christian Broadcasting Network. Uh, 
The point simply is, is that Donald Trump was going to be who Donald Trump is. And he wasn't going to, he didn't care about how, the optics and all of that. So my point is, this whole idea, this narrative you hear in the media that, oh, he just wants, he's doing this for evangelicals just so he can get reelected or this or that. Give me a break. Yeah. Donald Trump plays to an audience at this point of one, which is himself. In other words, you know, that's what, you know, but, but the good news is on the spiritual voyage part, he's seen a little bit more than just himself. Yeah, and I think that, that the fact of the matter is he doesn't pander. Um, and now yeah. we get such pushback on that. Like, are you kidding me? He's the ultimate panderer. You know, he's, he's, he's got you evangelicals wrapped around and you don't know your head from your tail. And, uh, and, and he, you've, he's completely bamboozled you. And it's like, really, that's just, not, that's just not the case because, you know, the evangelicals we've talked to, you know, they're like in private conversations. And when we talk to them on, uh, with the interviews, they're like, okay, I'm gonna tell you this stuff that, that we've got, but you don't put it in the book. I mean, I'm, I'm a pastor kind of thing and, and uh, you know, so just, it can't be in the book. And these are some real conversations with, the, with now the President of the United States about, you know, spiritual matters. And the fact of the matter is, if he's looking for some crib sheets, you know, some, some something to just memorize, to, to, to play off evangelicals, that's so easy to find. Just Google it and like, what do, uh, what do Christians like for people to say? I mean, we know there's a lot of candidates that are really good at that. Donald, for all the things that somebody wants to say bad about him, didn't actually do that in the last election. That's my take. Now, you can completely disagree with me, and you know, there's plenty of people who do, but I don't think that he was pandering to evangelicals. So what happened then? Because 81% of you know, exit polls, uh, evangelicals and exit polls voted for Donald Trump, and a year and a half later, everybody's still asking, what, what, what was that all about? And you know, there's the chief political correspondent for CBN, so I'll defer to him on that. You know, <laughs> but, uh, well, he, here, here's the, and, and for sure, the, how evangelicals got to voting for Donald Trump, there's, it's no doubt a Dr. Phil moment. I mean, I, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experiment. Um, but, but here's the answer. You know, Donald Trump sees the world in black and white, you know, uh, the, this idea of uh, absolutes, and evangelicals see the world in absolutes as well. And there's a kinship there. Um, in addition, Donald Trump has been ridiculed uh, for seeing the world in absolutes. Evangelicals have also been ridiculed for seeing the world in absolutes. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Uh, they've both been ridiculed in public. So you, you combine all of that, uh, and then you see a culture going to, in a handbasket, um, then you've, you, you've, you've got the cauldron of a culture warrior in Donald Trump, which just proves that God has a sense of humor, uh, to send Donald Trump of all people. Uh, so, so you put all of that together, and I think that's interesting. Also, I, I, it's important to understand that Donald Trump has a 19, remember, he's 19, uh, born in 1946, he's 71 years old, he has a 1950s, I, I remember Michelle Bachman saying to us that Donald Trump has uh, 1950s sensibilities, now before people have some sort of spasms there, um, because racism was quite a bit of an issue in the, in the 50s and even today. She wasn't talking about that. What she was referring to is he remembers a time where there was prayer in school. He remembers a time where you dressed up for church and you didn't come to church in baggy pants and, and um, uh, sneakers. Uh, he, remember, he has a, a, a reverence and a respect for clergy is what we found out. Uh, Daryl Scott, one of his close friends, says he, when he's in the room with clergy, he adopts the position of the lesser, not the greater. Things like that, uh, and there's so many, more, so many more anecdotes and actual tangible stories in this book that give you a different picture, that 18 seconds of Donald Trump. We're going to open it up to uh, questions in a few minutes, but uh, we can obviously anticipate some of the questions you might have because we, we've gotten them again and again. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of the basic things is, well, what about, and they'll pull out something he's done, uh, and I'm not talking about the last two years, I'm talking about you know, I'm not talking about policies or things that he's done in the White House as far as, uh, you know, uh, the, the direction of the country. I'm talking about, you know, his, uh, se his sexuality, his, his marriages, his women, his money, his pride, and his lying, you know, all that kind of stuff. So what do you do with that? And they're like, well, okay. So um, we don't have to defend any of that. Okay, so um, we're, you know, I'm going to tell you something that you probably didn't know, but we're not God and we're not Jesus. <laughs> we're not the Holy Spirit. I, I, I know I draw a lot, but I'm, I'm, I'm being serious, you know. Um, the Bible, you know, we're evangelicals, both of us are evangelicals, and at the heart of that, that means that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sinners, and people find salvation by believing in that, and just casting everything they've got on that, on that person, and on that person's work for them to cover up sin in their life, or if it's not covered up by his blood on the cross, then 
then it won't be, and, and then there's, you know, eternal punishment in hell. That's the basic evangelical gospel. Billy Graham preached that same message for 70 or 80 years, right? I mean, it really never changed. Uh, he wore different suits and different kinds of ties from each decade, but it was the same message. So what do I do with that, that, you know, five years ago Donald Trump did this and 10 years ago Donald Trump did this? Jesus <clears throat> gathered around himself one day uh, in Luke 15, um, he gathered around himself tax collectors, which were just the bad people today, and the prostitutes. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, said, they, the Bible says they grumbled. And they said to him directly, you shouldn't be doing that. Okay, so God who created the entire universe is eating with some of the little people that he created, right? And some of the other little people that he created think, oh, we're like, you know, we're, we're ahead of them because we're not prostitutes and tax collectors. Great, so they're Boy Scouts. Okay, great. And they probably memorized the whole Torah. And so they're, they're, they're thinking they're closer to God. And, um, and, and the Bible says, Jesus, in response to that, it literally says, in response to that, Jesus told a parable. Actually, he told three parables. The parable of the, nine, the 100 sheep, 99 were safely in the fold. Jesus went out and got the one that was lost. Then the parable of the lost coin, desperation, looking for the lost coin. But the third one is the most memorable one that we, we, we know, the parable of the, the prodigal son. Two sons, and one of them was Donald Trump. One of them was uh, evangelical leaders of today, perhaps. Uh, it's been me at times. I've been this way in my heart at times. Now, which one is Donald Trump? The, the younger brother. Uh, you know, he, he went out, he took his dad's money, and he went and he had uh, women and uh, uh, women, and, and we, you know, that's the, that's the thing, you know, the tabloid lifestyle. And he was in the pig pen. Now, everybody at this point wants to nail us and say, yeah, and he's never gotten out of the pig pen. He's never gotten away from prostitutes. Okay, but he's still alive. And it's only been the last two years that, and maybe 10 or 12 with some others, but, but that a huge number of gospel preaching pastors have gotten around him and started talking about the gospel. And they have. And we can't put all that in the book because that's private conversations, but they have. Anyway, the point is, he spent his money on wine, women, and song. Well, actually, Trump doesn't even drink wine, but the women in the song, just like, just like the younger brother. Now, here's the thing. He's eating the, the pig's food, and he says, you know what? This is really stupid. You know, I've spent all my dad's money. I obviously am not a son any longer. He's probably disowned me and hopes I die out here somewhere. But I'm going to at least go back and beg him to be a slave because the servants at least had food. So he goes and, and, and he's coming up the road and the dad is where the dad has been every day since he left. He's looking for the son. Now, Jesus told that parable. Jesus, God, told that parable and put himself in the position, put God, the creator of the universe, in the position of a dad desperate for his son to come home. That's a humiliating thing. And then he got, he was even worse. It says the man pulled up his, girded his loins, he pulled up his loins, and he ran, which, you know, that was an undignified thing, you know, back in, ran down the road to meet the son. God wrote those words so that we would understand that he really desires for sinners to come home. Okay, and he ran, and the son says, "Oh, dad, I'm sorry. You know, I know you hate me, and can I be a servant?" And the dad puts a ring on his finger. That's sonship. He puts a fresh uh, clothes on his back, and he says, "Oh, you're not a servant. You're a son. You are a son. Kill the fatted calf. Rejoice. This is the. This is wonderful." Okay. Now we think about the older brother, and we think, to, and we think, to, and we ask ourselves, well, "Who is he?" Oh, he's he's Christians that get grouchy at, at people. No, he's not. The older brother is people who haven't yet dis realized that they're sinners. The Pharisees, right? I know I'm preaching here a little bit, but this is so important. The, the older brother is like, why did you do this? You know, he doesn't deserve this. And the father says, you're right, and neither do you. <laughs> but you're too rule-keeping in your lifestyle to realize that you don't actually love me. You've been keeping the rules because you can't wait till you get my inheritance, but you don't really love me. And Jesus was condemning the Pharisees, and they knew it shortly thereafter they crucified him. So who is Donald Trump? The better question is, who is closer to finding gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ? Somebody who thinks that they've kept all the rules and they're a Boy Scout and they write for the National Review or the Weekly Standard and, or they're an evangelical leader? 
and, and, and the younger sons of, of our culture can't find the gospel? Man, that's not the church I'm part of. So Donald Trump, I don't know where he's at right this moment in his relationship with God. But he's, got, he's breathing oxygen and he's got a heart that still beats. So if he's apart from God right now, it ain't too late. I don't know if you're with me on that, but it ain't too late. And we've had such pushback to that to say, oh, but you, what about, what, what about? Hmm. I've got relatives I've been praying for as long as I've been old enough to pray a prayer. And they're as old as Donald Trump. And I ain't going to stop praying for them until they're dead. Hmm. And, and they've lived Donald Trump's lifestyle. I haven't stopped praying for them. Now, why would I do that? So we're not out to prove that he is already something. We're to show, have we forgotten what the gospel is? Dads almost disgracing themselves with prodigal love for sinners. That's what the gospel is. Well, thanks for coming to church tonight. Uh, Sorry. Thank you. Uh, okay. That was great. I didn't grow up. That was great. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Uh, with the offering, can we take the offering? Oh, brother. Uh, <laughs> hey, one of us Reagan was a Library saying, sure, we'll take the offering. <laughs> no. Um, so no, that was great. Uh, one quick story, and then we, we'll open up for, for questions. It was a time, th this is interesting, this is in the book about my dinner with Donald Trump. Uh, it was my wife and I, and Melania Trump and, and myself, and uh, we're in New York at this uh, very ritzy place, uh, it's like uh, Mickey D's. Um, no. Um, but we, it was a really nice place. Anyhow, just to give you a sense of the other side of Donald Trump, he leans into me for the first question. And I figure he's going to talk politics, immigration, the wall, we got to build it, you know, the whole thing. Instead, he looks at me and he goes, how's your marriage? I'm like, how's your marriage? <laughs> <laughs> so that just kind of blew my mind and just made me start thinking, percolating what's going through his mind exactly, like why, why would he ask me? And then two or three times during the conversation, Melania would be talking to my wife and he would interrupt. And then after he interrupted, he, was, he would stop and go, honey, I am so sorry, please go ahead. I'm like, Donald Trump saying I'm sorry three times in one conversation. So this all just kind of got, we, we put it in the book to illustrate a point, which is that there is this different side of Donald Trump. Once again, we're not saying the sainthood of Donald Trump. We're not saying uh, the, the born-again evangelical Christian Donald Trump. That's not what we're saying. But we are saying the faith journey of Donald Trump. And we all have a journey, and that is what we have. That's all the material we have. So let's open up to questions. So uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We are live streaming, and we need to have you on a microphone. So we will start right here. Hi, thank you very much. My question is, you mentioned Donald Trump's father and his grandfather. You didn't say much about his mother. Oh, My oh. understanding is that his mother had a tremendous influence with the Scottish um, Anglican uh, beliefs there. And could you say something about that kind of percentage, if you could characterize the mother influence versus the father influence, et cetera? Yes, I thank you so much. I got had pages of notes, and David's like, "You're not going to be able to get through all that stuff." <laughs> yes, the mother. I, I I could write an entire book about the mother. And I would love to. You know, my wife says, "How how are you going to write all the books that you would love to write?" But I mean, the mother grew up in this rustic, uh, remote village on the island uh, in, in Scotland, the New Hebridean Islands. And uh, it was like the, the, the real far off the coast, not the, the cities of Scotland. The point was, though, that even until about five years ago, uh, this island was so, uh, I don't know if the word staunch is, is a good word to use, but it was so um, very, very Presbyterian-ish that they didn't allow the ferry to run to the island on Sunday. So they were still Sabbatarian until I think about five years ago. That everybody, Everybody's Presbyterian. There's like 10 different versions of Presbyterian there, but everybody's Presbyterian, and they go to church. They learn the catechism. Um, now, she left when she was 18 because there weren't jobs and there, there were a lot of guys that had gotten killed during World War I and so there wasn't going to be marriage prospects. She left and went to New York City, but she brought with to her to the new world basically somebody who had grown up every Sunday in, in church and had learned the catechism uh, in uh, Welsh and Gaelic. Uh, and so uh, the key, I think, to the anchor of the Trump family would be the mother. Um, the father was German Lutheran and uh, the, 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 it, it had more fruition in basically just the, the German Protestant work ethic. So it was more just like very practical. Plus he lost his father when he was 14 uh, to the Spanish flu. And so all of a sudden he was just kind of thrown into manhood and he, he, he took it. 
Uh, Fred Wolf was an amazing man. Google Fred Wolf and you'll find like, oh, there's a caricature of him, you know, and, and a few things here and there about his life, and people just write the rest of it off. But Fred, uh, Fred Trump, his father, yeah. just amazing man. Um, and, and, and I don't think Fred Trump was overly, um, he was born in 1905, I believe, I, if I get that right. Um, I don't think he was an overly devout uh, in his piety, but his piety came through the building of things and, and working hard, providing for his family. And, and he was married to his wife to, uh, for, I think, 62 years, something like that, yes. till the day he died. And, uh, and, and, and so I think the parents are really the key to him. Um, yeah. I would just say one little nugget uh, on the McLeod family. That was her yeah. maiden name, the McLeod family. I love this he, he little, loves, he loves this, this is my, one of my favorite little nuggets in the book, which is that if you trace the DNA of the McLeods, long story short, but it looks like uh, the Don Donald Trump has some Viking blood in him. Which is to say the Vikings came down and basically, you know, conquered them like every 50 years or something. You know, there's that you picture, know, we, yeah, the picture in the Oval Office there. This was taken uh, eight days ago. Um, you know, we just, we, we wrote a book about him. We figured we should probably give him a copy. Um, and so we did. We're like, knock, knock, can we come in? No, we didn't do that. So, but basically... <laughs> So when we did that, um, I did tell him about the Viking blood story. And he looks at me and he kind of says, of course. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, what did you expect? <laughs> Anyhow. That's a great question. I think there's going to be more written. You know, uh, after Churchill died and uh, saved the world and then died, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books get written about these people and, um, and, and about their parents and about their siblings and all that kind of stuff. So I think that Donald Trump's entire biography will be a little more fleshed out. Right now, it kind of just centers on what he was doing in the 90s. You know, like most of the biographies are like the 1990s part of Donald Trump's life. But I think his parents' biography will really be plumbed by people who, who want to write good history. And maybe, maybe they don't like his politics, but could the historians out there just like write some good history? They all want to write these opinion books, you know. It's like, I don't want your opinions. You've you got a PhD in history. Write history, you know. But they all want to get on, uh, you know, CNN or something. Okay, I shouldn't go too far on that. More Next questions? One. Back there? Wait, wait for the microphone if you would. Yes, um, I, I wanted to ask about works. Um, the Bible says that um, faith without works is dead. And um, I really don't see any works of President Trump that would indicate that he was a Christian. And I'm wondering what your gentleman's opinion is on that issue. Well, um, I'll let you take uh, part of that. I, let me just start by saying, you, you can always make the argument, and we're not necessarily, I'm not, I'm not, once again, it's not an apologetics book for Donald Trump, so please, please understand that. I always have to do the, that disclaimer, very important. Um, but I think evangelicals would be pretty pleased with some of the works that have come out of this administration in the first year. Um, so, so I don't think there's any question about that. If you're looking at from a public policy perspective, I mean, everything from Jerusalem and the embassy to pro-life to Gorsuch, I can go on and on. I mean, this, he, he, he's delivered, according to evangelicals, not me, according to evangelicals, he's delivered a lot of fruit, if you will, a lot of works, uh, public policy-wise. Now, I, I think there's more to that answer than, than in terms of what you've raised. I was a pastor for 15 years, Bible vocational pastor, and I was in churches where I had a lot of uh, folks that were sick and senior adults uh, that, uh, that would you know, be coming to the end of life that were asking me you know, those kinds of questions like, uh, how do I know that when I die I'm actually gonna be in heaven? And, uh, and so I'd ask them, well, what do you think? And anytime I heard somebody rattle off all the good stuff they had done, I'd say, man, let's, let's go to the Bible. Let's just go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about good works, you know, and it's a fruit of salvation, but it's not the foundation of salvation. So I, I know what the gospel is. I've been faithful in my pastoral ministry to explain that we're not saved by our good works, but if you're saved, you do have good works. And, um, you know, if we took a poll and you said, does Donald Trump have good works enough to merit that we think he's a Christian? Some people would say this, some people would say that. Ah, I'm not really concerned about that, you know, to, to, with the book. Um, does, that, does that make sense? I mean, I understand what you're driving at with the gospel not being, uh, you know, uh, you're not supposed to be devoid of works. I'm just saying that, uh, right. um, that uh, we, don't, we, don't, we, we actually don't even shy over that in, in, the, in, the, in the book. When it comes to the parts of his life where he was divorcing his wives and having girlfriends, it's in the book. 
you know? So when he's spending prolifically and, and doing stupid things, it's in the book. It is in the book. We actually wondered if he was going to hate us after it, you know, <laughs> to be honest. Um, because like, well, maybe you could have like, right. you know, covered that part up, but why? You know, he's lived his life out in the open and he's even boasted about a lot of that stuff. So, you know, there's just, there's no covering it up at this point. You know, there's no writing a book that just covers that up, so. Yeah, and God will have that final say and not the anchors at CNN, which is good, so. I think we have a question right here. I have two questions. What did Donald's feedback to you on that book was? And the second question is, how did you two connect? <laughs> hey, you take the first, I'll take the second. Okay, uh, his feedback. Well, you have to understand, the book just came out. I, we made sure to not give him or anybody in the White House an advanced copy, uh, obviously. <laughs> I don't need a call on my cell phone. Um, no, so, so he, when we presented that book to him, literally it had come out the day before. So he said he was going to read it. And then I think about five or six days later, he he, he tweeted about he it. He tweeted it out. Yeah. He, he tweeted, yeah. He said, uh, he said, what is this piece of? No, no, he didn't say that. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but he, um, yeah, he tweeted it out five days later. Now, uh, so so, and he called it an interesting read, is what he said. <laughs> you can interpret that any way you want. Yeah. Uh, he said an interesting read, but then at the end he put enjoy with an exclamation point. <laughs> uh, so. But uh, we haven't had any personal feedback from the White House, and actually that's just the way we like it. Although the vice president said he'd been looking forward to it for a long time and he was going to read it that weekend. So he seemed really enthused. We bumped into him on the we, way out of the We Oval bumped office. out of him Oval Office and he says to me, he goes, I'm going to read it this weekend and then I'm going to call you, is what he said. And I said, well, then I'm going to make sure my phone number is unlisted, is what I told him. <laughs> and he but, laughed and then he hit me in the stomach and I don't know what happened after. I think I passed out. So the second question, uh, how do we do it? Actually, the people that are in this, some of the people in this room um, kind of made this possible, in this room kind of made this possible, because like I said, I, I started getting involved with the American Renewal Project, and uh, some of you people sitting on the front row here, uh, Pastor Rob McCoy, and some of you all know him, right? Uh, brought him out here? Yeah. yeah so I, I joke with people, I, you know, I'm from the Midwest, and, and I don't think I'd ever gone past Denver until I got hooked up with these people. And so I basically know LAX, and really nice restaurants in Thousand Oaks that people take me to, and this place. And somebody said, you know, you've got a really jaded uh, understanding of Southern California, you know, <laughs> the airport, restaurants, and, and uh, Simi Valley, Reagan Library. But at any rate, the point is that we met because uh, they would host uh, Pastors and Pews events uh, where they were encouraging pastors to be uh, to be active in their citizenship and not just give that up just because they were a pastor. And so he would show up because he was doing some lectures there and, and some presentations. I showed up because I was kind of curious and I was uh, on the tail end of writing the Mike Huckabee autobiography. Uh, and uh, we started hanging out in the back afterwards and talking. And at some point in the in the in the primaries before the Iowa caucuses, we were talking about maybe I don't know maybe a faith of Ted Cruz kind of thing, maybe an article. Maybe he would write something for a magazine because, you know, Ted Cruz was kind of leading the polls. And, and Trump, we're like, well, he's not really going to do it, is he? You know, <laughs> at any rate, the further it went on, that kind of just morphed. And then, of course, the primary season ended and uh, we kept th talking, well, what's going to happen? And nobody thought he was going to win. And then he did win. And uh, so, again, the night of the election, we had a conversation. I said, well, should we pull the trigger on that? I mean, because we had editors that wanted us to pull the trigger. I mean, it's about the president and you're going to explain something that people are curious in. So um, last spring, we, we had uh, several editors that, that were talking to us about it. And about Easter, uh, one of them uh, came and, uh, you know, made us a good offer for it. And they said, but you got to have it done by Labor Day. <laughs> like, now, did you remember we were going to interview 100 people for the book, right? You know, mm -hmm. and he said, yeah, so if you can have it done by Labor Day, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. So we did it. And I didn't, we didn't, I don't think either one of us got up from the computer screen for about 100 days. No, no, uh, no, not at all. Type but, in. Uh, but it was a good thing. That interview with the president of the Oval Office happened late August, four days before our deadline. <laughs> uh, and Mike Pence's two interviews happened actually after the deadline. So we had to extend that a little bit. And as for my Jewish roots, uh, you can imagine how this is going over my liberal Jewish family. Now, one of the... <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Talk about Jewish guilt. David, David one of the things... In, I mean, I am Jewish after all. In, in answering that question, one of the things that we make clear right from the beginning in the introduction yeah. is that we wanted to actually set an example for the body of Christ yeah. that we think that the, uh, that the body of Christ in America is really in tribes 
that don't talk to each other. Right, right. And uh, I said, uh, how fun it would be to like have the tribes get together a little bit more and talk. And not just like, well, you're not really good enough. I mean, we're probably going to heaven together, but I'm not really going to fellowship with you on this earth. In there when we're sanctified, but not here. And I, I was like, David, you know, we don't come from the same tribe. Let's, let's try to, you know, fellowship together. And I said, hey, this is crazy about writing a book, a book that's going to be under intense scrutiny and pressure filled. I've written four books and all four of them were with co-authors and it just about destroys your friendship, okay? I mean, it really does. All my co-authors and I, we came back around to friendship after the book was written, but it really puts, and this one about this topic with this Jewish guy and this Baptist guy, you know, hanging out with the Pentecostals that my tribe says literally are heretics that won't be in heaven. <laughs> so, my, right now I'm the vice president and my, my, my direct report, I, I directly report to Jerry Falwell Jr. Do you, do you know Jerry Falwell Jr.? Do you remember what he did during the election in terms of his support for Donald Trump? You know, like really supportive? So before that, I, you know, a couple years ago, before that I was, my, my, my immediate boss was a guy who became one of the leading never Trumpers in America. And, uh, and, his, and we were colleagues and we're friends. We emailed this morning about stuff, still friends. But the point is the never Trump and the pro Trump, you know, just kind of really wrench some evangelicals asunder. And we said, hey, why don't, we, why don't we just see if we can write this book, maintain friendship, actually deepen a friendship and give the world a kind of a, a, give the evangelical world an understanding that maybe we need to break down these silos a little bit and come together just a little bit more right. and stop using the H for heresy word a little bit, you know, and, and especially with people that you think are actually, you know in your heart, you're going to be walking with Jesus. Right. Okay, let's have a little more fellowship there. Lay down the, you know, the big guns of, of, the, of those, those heresy words. We did that, and uh, we're going to do it again. <laughs> I was like, David. So, um, you know, I, I think we're, we, we want to do it again. There's other projects. Maybe not quite as intense, <laughs> but uh, other projects. I like you. Well, thanks, David. I like you. I, I think we have a question right there. The gentleman standing. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, is there a background story to Trump's decision to, make, uh, to move the embassy to Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, uh, I know, David, you've been in Washington for quite a while. Uh, can you contrast the atmosphere in the White House today versus the White House four years ago? Yeah. <laughs> and thanks for that. Um, no, thank you so much. Um, the backstory, I mean, there's a lot of different details in terms of the backstory on, on the Jerusalem Embassy thing, but look, this is, so, this is something that has been discussed for a very long time. Uh, even going back as far as the campaign of what they were going to do if indeed he actually won the White House. And uh, so Mike Pence was heavily involved. Jared Kushner was heavily involved. Uh, and there were so many different folks that were leading the effort. And it was all kind of a, obviously behind the scenes. And uh, so, so, you know, th there's a couple different ways you can you, you can look at what happened behind the scenes. I will just say this, that many evangelical leaders were brought in whether it be uh, you know, the John Hagees of the world and some other folks and uh, just a lot of different folks that were asked to give counsel about Jerusalem and um, the significance of moving the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, specifically as a, as a, uh, because it's a, the holy city. So evangelicals were heavily involved in that. And what was the second? Oh, the White House. <laughs> I was trying to avoid it. Um, <laughs> The White House. Yeah, it's hectic. It's hectic. I mean, I'm, I'm literally on medication 24-7 covering the White House. Uh, no, it's, it, they, he doesn't stop. He doesn't stop, but that's what he said he would do, right? He said he wouldn't stop, and he doesn't, and um, he is uh, for sure his own worst enemy at times, and other times there's something about him. He, he, you know, a lot of people get on his case because he's not book smart, but he's street smart. And I'll tell you what, he's been playing the media like a fiddle for a long time. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I'm just saying. Uh, you know, we are at the Reagan Library and, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan, uh, talk about playing the media like a fiddle. Ronald Reagan, boy, he was, uh, he was impressive. He, he was one step ahead of the media at all time. I, I, I like to say that Ronald Reagan, though, he did it with a butter knife. Uh, Donald yeah. Trump does it with a hacksaw. <laughs> uh, that's a little bit of the difference. 
Uh, and there's carnage everywhere. I think we have time for one more question. Right here. Hello. Um, what faith is Baron Trump, Baron Trump being raised in, and what faith is Melania? Yeah, um, so when I've written uh, biographies in the past, then the editors have wanted to know, well, what about the children? Tell us about the children. And you really just have to either say, well, I'm going to, and I'm going to do it well, or you're not really going to do that. And it's an easy thing to do when, the, it, like in Barron's case, he's not even 18. I just say, well, that's off limits. You know, I'm not going to go probing into it under 18. I wouldn't want that if I was 13 or 14 years old. When they're grown at children, maybe it enters a conversation. I'm not saying, you know, grown children are off limits. Uh, I wrote the, the Huckabee uh, book and uh, got to know Sarah a little bit. And I wish I'd put more of her in the book because, you know, people might actually buy the Huckabee book now, you know, uh, more. But, uh, you know, just because of her, you know, uh, the governor said, uh, yeah, now where, wherever I go, they say, hey, aren't you Sarah's dad? You know, and uh, I actually had somebody come up to me and they said, did you write that Huckabee biography? I said, yeah. Wow. So how long have you known Sarah? And I said, uh, <laughs> I said, you know, it's about Mike Huckabee. Who's that? You know, like <laughs> what Huckabee book are we talking about? But, anyway, but no, the point is that, you know, when it's about the kids, you just kind of leave them off, off the limit. Uh, you know, I, I just, we, we didn't talk about them. We didn't talk about Baron. Uh, about Melania, she's from Roman Catholic. Yeah, Roman Catholic Roman background. Catholic. And, uh, uh, but that's, that's pretty much how you kind of decide to do that or not. Um, uh, Jared, of course, is... Uh, J Jewish. Yeah, I know, but I mean, oh. uh, what, what branch? Uh, 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 I believe he's, is he Orthodox? He might oh, be conservative yeah. or Orthodox. Right. Uh, so. or it's, or it's Orthodox because, you know, it's the Sabbath and, and on Saturday. I think we mentioned in the book for a sentence or two. Ivanka yeah. and Jared go... Um, and you went on a trip to Israel the with them. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, no. I mean, alongside. Oh, oh, I was, yeah, yeah I was overseas, and I, I ran into Ivanka and Jared on the mm -hmm. plane. That was fun. Um, so, yeah, but, but I'll just say this. My quick Barron story has nothing to do really with your question, but it was kind of interesting. Um, we were in the Oval Office for this interview. Uh, I was sitting down with the president, and Barron actually walked into the Oval Office. And I'm like, okay, well, you're cutting into my interview time is what I thought. Uh, but that's all right. You know, he's a young child. And uh, so I just, it's just a cute little story. He says, uh, Dad, I'm really thirsty, is what he says. And uh, so he asked someone for a Diet Coke, and he was very polite. Can I have a Diet Coke? And uh, so someone ran and got him a Diet Coke in the Oval Office. And Trump looks at me and goes, what a life this kid has. He comes into the Oval Office, orders a Diet Coke. <laughs> oh, sat back as a New Yorker. Yeah. Anyhow, a little bit of Donald Trump. Uh, a well, color for you. One thing that I think, we, we obviously didn't uncover this. Everybody knows this, but uh, there is something pretty special about his relationship with his children. And, and there's, sure. there's something that they have. Uh, Governor Matt Bevin, um, when we interviewed him, uh, because he had gotten to know the Trumps, uh, he said, you know, the thing that is really going to come out is just how, how developed emotionally and uh, in, their, in their own ethics those kids are. He said, you know, and, and Governor Bevin has uh, eight children, and he's all about, you know, how to pass things down to the next generation. He said, you know, um, there's just something of a real substance there, and they've got a work ethic. He goes, I don't know if you could just bottle that up. And he goes, but that's got to come from the parent, you know, because you just, that, that's where it comes from, yeah. down, down the pipe. And uh, that was the, th the thing that impressed him the most about Trump. He said, I don't know about the rest of it, but I know that, that those children are really something. Well, he told me in that first interview in April 2011, he says, I have four rules for my children. No drinking, no smoking, no drugs, no tattoos. That's what he told them. And, uh, and, and that's the deal. And that, I'm just telling you what he told me. I, you know. And so, um, so he said that. And then there's this great story about Ivanka. She's 17 years old. And it's like the end of junior year of high school or senior year of high school, something like that. And she goes, she walks into Trump's office and says, daddy or dad, I don't know what you call him. You know, hey, so uh, me and like four of my friends, we, were, we have this great idea. We're going to go this summer to the south of France. Uh, and it's going to be great. We're going to have this great time. We're going to do this. And then, Donald Trump looked at her and said, okay, honey, here's the thing. Tell your friends to have a great time in the south of France, but I'll see you here Monday morning <laughs> at 9 a.m. Uh, for work. You're not going anywhere. Uh, it's the hard work ethic that he has instilled in his children. It comes from those Lutheran German yeah. roots from his father, uh, and it's all part of the faith of Donald Trump. David and I would like to thank you for coming out tonight. Thank We're you. really honored thank that you, you would be here. Thank you. Thank you.